Thank you very much, Desmond. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to be in such august company, and also really bringing together such um, an excellent group of speakers uh, from which I think the government can actually learn a lot about data governance. So my presentation today, for which I have no clicker, I assume it's, it's here somewhere, um, is uh, on data governance. Am I supposed to go up to the stage? Most people have been here. Okay, all right. Uh, let me just uh, move myself. All right, it's nice to feel tall. <laughs> okay. Um, the topic we're speaking on today is big data and the citizen. And uh, my perspective is really from the government's point of view. And as I've mentioned, um, what does this mean uh, with regards to data governance within a smart nation context? I'm fairly sure all of you may have heard the term smart nation in the course of the last, uh, last day of discussions because I'm sure that that's been uh, brought out in terms of what are the benefits of big data. And the first comment I'd like to make is that the citizen does not care about big data. He truly does not see data as something uh, that he needs to apply his mind to. Uh, the only thing that he would be concerned about is what are the applications? What are the uses of that? What are the benefits of that to himself that he can see uh, through the tools that are created? So smart nation. Uh, for us, smart nation is largely about benefits to the citizen. Um, it is about improving and bettering the quality of life for everyday Singaporeans uh, using data. And when I say data, I mean not just big data, but also the small data. Uh, that resides in you know, sort of government databases or company databases everywhere uh, that can actually be analyzed. <laughs> Our vision for a smart nation also includes some element of uh, digital government. Um, we envisage a, a, really a country that engages you know, uh, use the use of technology, particularly the use of, uh, use of data to engage citizens to create an anticipatory government, that is the use of data to understand our citizens, something that in banking you call know your customer, but something in government we want to call know your citizen, uh, in order to create anticipatory services for our citizens. Um, those, this should also include responsive munis municipal uh, and also e-services. Um, and you know, together, we hope that uh, this vision of a smart nation will uh, enable our citizens to be more empowered, uh, more engaged, uh, and more served uh, in terms of government services. Now, what does that mean in terms of the, the what does that mean in terms of how, how data fits in, in the collection and comprehension and creation um, aspects? First of all, uh, Smart Nation really relies on um, uh, the notion that we need to create uh, a comprehensive network of connectivity, something that in IDEA we call being connected uh, everything to everything, everywhere, anytime, uh, and everyone. Um, so this, um, this is manifested you know, physically in terms of infrastructure, of course, uh, the National Broadband Network, uh, possibly one of the uh, most extensive uh, national broadband networks in the world, um, bringing high-speed fiber to uh, residences and fiber to the home. A wireless at SG, uh, which will be expanded considerably and now requires uh, no login password. <laughs> and um, also other concepts that we are experimenting with, including heterogeneous networks, uh, which would seamlessly transfer between uh, wireless, cellular, and Wi-Fi, and so on, uh, and the Smart Nation platform. You may have heard about the Smart Nation platform, but if you haven't, um, I just want to j briefly describe how it is a, a mesh, a network of sensors across the island, uh, collecting d data um, regarding not only um, uh, things related to security and safety, for example, CCTV data, but also um, environmental data, um, I think Minister Vivian yesterday mentioned the example of drains and floods uh, and wind and so on. 
And uh, this would actually be all part of the connectivity that would then lead to the idea of collection and comprehension of that data through, again, a data exchange platform um, that we are building uh, to, with, uh, with all the requisite security uh, and privacy components built in. But the key thing in a smart nation, of course, is the creation component. It's the creation of new services. It's the creation of uh, more choices. It's the creation of applications. Uh, and for this, we are looking at the government and for the private sector to come in and say, you know, if we had that, if we had that framework, we had that network uh, where we could co collect the data and comprehend it, what kind of services, what kind of applications uh, could arise in order to create anticipatory services and empower citizens. So, this leads, of course, to the question of data protection. So because when we, when we announced the Smart Nation initiative, uh, this was on the minds of quite a lot of uh, citizens. You know, how are you going to protect this data that you've just collected from me? Um, so in Singapore, there's actually a Personal Data Protection Commission, which, um, and they enforce the Personal Data Protection Act. Uh, this act is not a privacy legislation. It is a protection legislation. Let me explain the difference. Um, I think that it's useful at this point to just go through what are the big differences uh, between big data and personal data, privacy and data protection, because they're really not the same thing. Um, currently, like most jurisdictions, we have data protection law, and it focuses on personal data. Big data is not personal data, not necessarily. Uh, a lot of it uh, involves um, environment. So if you take an environmental sensor, for example, or a lot of the M2M data, I think that can arguably say, be said not to necessarily be personal data. And then you have the issue of privacy and data protection, and they are clearly not the same thing. If you, exam if you were to um, put it in the form of a, a house, for example, uh, you Data protection really are the walls that you build around the house to protect what is inside. So as long as it's uh, collected you know, and protected whilst being collected or, or used or moved around, that is fine. Privacy is the curtain you draw over the house. So technically, if you had a full data protection regime, uh, you could see what's in the house, but you cannot touch it. Privacy says you, can't, you shouldn't even be able to see it. So um, I think these are, these are things that the government is currently grappling with, you know, how, to, how and to what extent to make the move from data protection to privacy. Because in a smart nation, the demands for that actually are increasing. Now, how is big data different? Of course, the, the three Vs have been mentioned by Desmond previously, much, much higher in volume. Um, by 2020, we're looking at about 40 zettabytes, I can't even imagine what that is, <laughs> of big data uh, available in the world. Um, and also presenting new challenges and risks. Um, for example, re-identification. Um, it's possible to say that uh, what, when you collect a certain amount of data about a person, you can anonymize it. But if you collect way too much data about that person, the risk of re-identification does increase because you know, it's really possible to break the anonymization. Then there's the issue of conventional data protection principles. And these generally, uh, there are two big ones. That is um, limitations in use and consent. So the whole idea of data protection um, under our act, for example, uh, would mean that an organization who collects or, or transfers or uses the data has got to get the consent of the individual for his personal data to be used. Um, and also, uh, it can only be used for a particular purpose. Now, you can obviously see how in a big data landscape um, where the, the primary consideration is the value you get out the data, not what you do to protect it, just the, the value trumps all, um, it's very hard to say this is limited in purpose because the purposes can change depending on what you get out of the insights that you get out of the data. So the purpose is clearly not always the same. 
And consent uh, for um, a large part of big data is also very difficult to obtain. Um, if it's, uh, for example, a video. So a lot of data is big because it is video. And um, you know, you're not going to get the consent of everybody who walks past the camera uh, that you know, that image be used for a certain purpose. What we've done so far is merely to say that you know, every organization that puts a camera somewhere, a CCTV camera, must put a sign that says there is a CCTV camera here and you're being watched. But that's pretty much it. We can't get anyone's consent for the purposes of that footage. And then finally, there are privacy concerns with regards to big data because there are eth ethical uh, uh, considerations. Many private companies have used big data um, for things like um, extensive A-B testing. And I think many of you will remember the Facebook example earlier this year where they, you know, they played with the emotions uh, of, of some of their users by uh, putting out things that were you know, in different forms uh, designed to evoke that emotional reaction. Uh, and that was not well received at all. Technically, that's not a privacy consideration. But every time someone does something uh, that, uh, that causes ethical considerations to arise, privacy suddenly comes to the fore. It, it, just, it just naturally, the conversation leads there. When we handle um, data, uh, especially big data, there is also the issue of um, transnational handling. Um, many times, um, laws are jurisdictional, so they only protect uh, the use and handling of data within a certain country. The thing about big data is that it does also tend to be large enough to be stored somewhere else on someone else's cloud. So you can see the number of people handling an individual's data from the hardware manufacturer that captures it to the OS provider, then the infrastructure provider, some cloud somewhere, which is not here. Um, and then when it becomes an application to move some of that data to advertisers, it becomes a far more complex process of trying to decide what, you know, where do you draw the line, where do you put in the regulation, um, and how on earth does that cross um, national boundaries? And I think this is something that a lot of regulators are facing issues with. So what shall we do about this? Um, for Singapore, the data protection landscape really continues to evolve. Um, the PDPC, which in uh, the PDPA, which really only came into effect last year, uh, to we also um, acknowledge the need to uh, think through new ways of looking at data especially big data, and what will become of our legislation as a result. Um, a, number of the future, a number of future possibilities that we're looking at um, include privacy by design. I think it's very important when you build um, a smart nation platform, uh, a national, nationwide sensor network, that a lot of the and a data exchange platform or federated data exchange platform that a lot of the security and privacy mechanisms are built into the engineering of the um, of even of the hardware and the software uh, on which it sits. So there's no point um, discussing it later. It has to be thought of before it is built. Uh, the next point is well, privacy by design. Um, uh, kind of works hand in hand with the notion of anonymization. So we would want at this point to anonymize as much of the data that comes through those sensors as possible. Something that works hand in hand with that is the idea of third party verification. I mean, already a small industry of third party verifiers has sprouted saying, okay, I can verify that this company has taken all reasonable steps to ensure that the data is protected and privacy is ensured. Then there's the notion of radical transparency. Um, this is something that, uh, that gets away from anonymization, but says that, hey, if you are going to use some my personal data, I would like to be, you to be radically transparent about the way in which you use it. And maybe I'm OK with it as long as I can tell you that I'm OK that you use it in such and such a manner. Um, one of the uses of this I saw in Estonia 
where the citizens um, where the citizen can actually the citizen's data is online, but he can actually he can actually check uh, which government agency has touched his data, uh, even slightly. So he can tell, for example, if um, the police has been using it for nefarious purposes. No, an individual policeman decided to touch his data for purposes that were not authorized. So the data is all there, but the government is really transparent about how they use it and. Who they, who's they, who's they've used, and for what. The last two actually go together, and I think this is one of the most interesting areas uh, that we're exploring, which is the do no harm approach and data as public infrastructure. Because if you want to get away from, if you, if you want to take one step further out of anonymization, and one step further from transparency, we can swing all the way to the other end and say, well, you know, why don't we regard data as public infrastructure? Um, your data doesn't essentially belong to you insofar as it creates a public good. It is open and can be used and should be used as long as it creates value and does not harm you. So your data is open except insofar as it causes something that you can show harms you. So the owner suddenly becomes on the individual to say, this, this use of this data has not in fact benefited me. So you know, using my location data in Google Maps benefits me because I can find out where to go. So that benefits me. Using some of my data so that the police can catch me uh, could be seen as harming me. <laughs> so and for that, you require consent. For everything else, you require nothing more than an acceptance that it is, in fact, public infrastructure. Most recent developments, such as the right to be forgotten and IoT, because you know, IoT, um, by the time you, you look at how uh, you know, data has been transmitted between your wearable and your fridge, and you know, just because someone knows that you're the kind of person who drinks three orange juices a day and, and you know, leaves the house at this time, it's an IoT world does that constitute personal data, would be the challenges, uh, would, would be the frame along which we test some of the assumptions that we have, um, and also um, the, the, the principles that we're trying out in the previous slide. So in conclusion, um, what Singapore intends to do is to maintain trust, not just responsive public services, responsive smart nation, but to maintain trust in the processes by which we have uh, done that, the process by which we have obtained that kind of data and, and used it. Uh, these, are the, these, the, these are the mechanisms by which we intend to do so, and we'd love to hear your feedback and your comments about how better we can approach the issue. Thank you. <laughs>